Well, good morning, everybody. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thanks, General Swan. Um, thanks, General Ham, who's uh, not here right now, but uh, appreciate, um, again, the opportunity to share with you some thoughts on uh, Army modernization challenges and the modernization imperative I think we face today. It's great to see so many familiar faces in the audience, some old bosses, lots of mentors, um, lots of aviators, uh, but uh, I guess I shouldn't be surprised there. And so as the FD, I've learned uh, my primary weapon systems in the building are logical ar arguments, clear clearly articulated requirements supported by analysis and available resources to conduct modernization activities for the Army. Our prioritized program funding must connect logically from the concepts, strategic guidance, through um, fielding with actual capabilities. I've also discovered that uh, working in the G8, and on, on behalf of uh, General Murray, um, working in the G8, it's a great place to work. It's a place that you rarely have to say you're welcome to anybody. I'll just kind of let that sink in for a minute. Yeah. So I'm hoping today's discussion won't disappoint. During my early years as an infantryman, uh, I got to know a lot of aviators, and uh, I appreciated their bold swagger, risk-taking, sunglass-wearing, perfect hair, and large personalities, and their ability to put me almost within reach of the objective and, <laughs> and close, to my, um, close to my equipment sometimes that made it on the same landing zone. Now as the FD, I know even more aviators. And uh, I've grown to appreciate them in, uh, in new ways. Hair is not always as perfect. I mean, it happens to all of us. Uh, but the swagger is still there. And uh, while I appreciate um, that every senior seasoned aviator recognizes the good news that the portfolio aviation is the largest portfolio in equipping in our, uh, in our Army, they're also such great team players. They're willing to sacrifice just a little bit. They're willing to donate a portion of that large portfolio for all the other equipping problems and challenges that we have in our, uh, in our army, so thank you for giving. <laughs> and again, you're welcome. <clears throat> so uh, seriously, we're the largest portfolio, and with the Army's only multi-year contracts for uh, aircraft and H-64, UH-60, uh, recently awarded EMD contract for the CH-47 Block II, uh, aviation's doing pretty well. Um, we all know the world has changed with increasing uncertainty and ever-growing complexity. The overmatch our Army has enjoyed for the last 70 years is quickly slipping away across all domains of warfare. Army forces must possess the capabilities and be prepared to fight and to win across multiple domains through contested areas to deter potential adversaries and when deterrence fails, rapidly defeat them. And we've heard it said by senior um, leaders across the Army that now we're seeing examples where we're outgunned, outranged, and our equipment is outdated. If I can go to the next slide, and we'll leave this up for the rest of the uh, presentation. I've heard many suggest that the Army should innovate itself out of our current dilemma. I also heard the former DepSec Def say that innovation is not the Army's problem. The Army's problem is money. Our ability to innovate remains constrained on many levels. When adjusted for inflation, the Army's buying power for modernization and equipment in 2018 will be just 60% of what it was in 2009, eight years ago. That's a reduction of close to $8 billion in procurement and $3 billion in RDT&E. With just half the money that we had eight years ago and approximately 181,000 soldiers supporting combatant commanders in 140 countries, innovation might just make a dent. For the last nine years, the Army has focused its limited modernization um, on incremental upgrades to existing systems and new starts only for the most critical capability gaps. It made sense strategically to, to deter the development of new combat capabilities in order to preserve current capabilities and provide our soldiers with the needed um, equipment for fights in Afghanistan and Iraq. I mean, that was the right option. That was the right trade-off for modernization um, uh, to give us our current advantage. So additionally, as we heard, sequestration, it's still the law. And the year after year continuing resolutions have also forced the Army to make some hard choices. Choices which have led us to focus our resources on generating and maintaining the best trained and equipped forces that a fiscally constrained environment would allow. We have had continuing resolutions for the eight last years straight and have had 10 CRs in the last 12 years. And as everyone in this room probably knows, that means that we have to operate at the previous year's uh, funding levels. It prohibits us from starting new programs. 
It stops us from entering new multi-year contracts. It prohibits increasing production rates or reprogramming funds. For the Army, that's 18 new starts and eight production rate increases that we will not be able to advance in FY18. Last April, during senior leader testimony, it was suggested that dealing with the CR should be the new norm. And our chief made the point that we should not accept routine recurring CRs, and he rejected this notion. He said failure to pass a budget constitutes professional malpractice. He went on to use a simple analogy that I'd like to repeat. It'd be like smoking cigarettes. One cigarette's not gonna kill you, but if you do it for eight, 10, 20, 30 years, you're eventually gonna die of lung cancer. It's the cumulative effect of money in, money out, and unknowing um, what resources you have that's a problem. We need a budget. So with re reduced investment and modernization, fiscal constraints have forced the Army to adopt a strategy that you see here on the slide of risking, um, accepting risk and starting new programming, programs, prioritizing incre incremental upgrades of existing systems that can be in the hands of soldiers quickly, and mortgaging our future to address the needs of today. We have not modernized for full spectrum warfare, and we risk the loss of overmatch in every domain, land, air, maritime, space, and cyber. So our current modernization strategy is gonna remain the same, essentially without an, inf an infusion of additional resources. We must protect S&T. We're gonna sustain incremental improvements. We're gonna take risk in new development. We're gonna go slow to keep options open, and we're gonna divest of unneeded old equipment. We're gonna focus our limited modernization budget on equipment that will have the greatest impact that we can put in our hands of our soldiers in, this, uh, in the near future. So I think we have to ask ourselves, is this a sustainable strategy? And if it is, for how long? If it's not a sustainable strategy, where should we take risk? Where do we go to find the money and move to a more aggressive modernization strategy? If you look at the chart, over 50% of our resources go towards paying people. If you wanna protect the size of the force or you wanna grow the force, that's a fixed cost, it's not gonna go down. If, if um, readiness is the number one priority, that piece of the pie is protected. There's only one place left to go that's fungible in terms of finding resources. So the good news is we've sustained many programs to either upgrade current weapon systems or rapidly adapt new technologies or increase productions. We all call these programs shovel ready. So with increased funding, we believe we can quickly increase delivery of capabilities. Unfortunately, we do remain under sequestration. We remain under the fiscally constrained uh, environment and we remain facing uncertainties associated with this other, another continuing resolution. So again, I think we have to ask ourselves, can we afford to do both incremental modernization and improvements while at the same time investing in the next generation of capability? And can we afford not to? The reality we face is that in the shadow of a near peer and potential future peer competitors, we no longer have the luxury of choosing between existing systems, improving existing systems, or developing new systems. We now have no choice, we have to do both. As our chief said, the only thing more expensive than fighting and winning a war is fighting and losing a war. In order to see ourselves and build opportunities do, to do both, last year the Army conducted the inaugural Strategic Portfolio Analysis Review. We call that the SPAR, you may have heard about it. This enables senior leaders to make informed resource decisions within a larger strategic framework and for senior leaders to weigh in early on the program development uh, process. Based on the analysis and comparison of 21 independent assessments, the Army G3 developed a list of highly converged recommendations prioritized by operational um, impact and arranged over time to mitigate operational and strategic risk to guide our analysis. Through this bar, the Army prioritized limited modernization resource, resources. We, gated, we weighed against risks and critical capability gaps in order to balance near-term readiness requirements against long-term force development aspirations. The goal as far is to model and test somewhat, uh, somewhere around 780 pro programs in a scenario with a near-peer adversary, and we prioritize our capabilities into four bins. So in those four bins, we're essentially, these are critical capabilities, and bin, bin one, if we had these four critical capabilities that the Army must have to have a de decisive advantage, and uh, we're gonna increase investments there. The second bin were critical capabilities that we should, su should, should sustain. They're doing okay, we're gonna keep them on the same funding level. The third bin, those were important capabilities, but they're an area where we can reduce uh, funding and accept some risk. And the fourth bin, still important capabilities, but we should completely divest 
and stop uh, funding towards those uh, capabilities. So SPAR validated a number of, of high priority uh, requirements, capability gaps, and key program areas, and those are listed on the slide. Those are our top 10 near-term uh, capability priorities, and you've probably seen these before. And for the aviation community, I think there are ties on several of these uh, priorities, particularly with munition shortfalls, active protection systems, because that's air and ground, um, assured communications, and, and uh, number 10 there, vertical lift. So what else do we find in SPAR? We found that chronic underfunding of research development and acquisition accounts has left us with these significant gaps that we must address. We also found that there are no easy wins. There are no programs, there are no capabilities that we would consider low-hanging fruit anymore. Programs we looked at, remember, in the fourth bend were still important capabilities that the Army, the Army frankly requires, but they're areas we can accept risks. So um, just as country, uh, country singer Chris Gant uh, Jansen also says, um, I know, I would sing it for you, but you may not like that. He says, I know everybody says money can't buy happiness, but it can buy me a boat and it can buy me a truck to pull it. So money can solve a lot of our problems. That's something we found. An infusion of funding would significantly increase the sluggish pace of modernization, keeping in mind that, our mo that most of our programs are already at minimum sustaining rates and can absorb increases. Those are those shovel-ready programs. We have to make room for new emerging technologies. For example, under our current strategy with aviation, we have to buy out the entire UH-60 and AH-64 fleet before we can afford FEL. And so when you stack up all the requirements, not just in the aviation portfolio, but when you start stack up requirements and those requirements are stacking up in the future, something has to give. With 88% of the aviation force currently committed, the aviation equipping budget falling nearly 42% since uh, 2012, Forecasts for continuing reduction in buying power and future domains that will be with more capable enemies and in more complex environments. Global demand for Army aviation puts a premium on readiness today with limited rapid modernization to incremental improvements only. The size and scale of combat aviation brigades compared to other service rotary wing fleets, the scope, the cost, and diversity of the mission set has stymied our rapid introduction of cutting edge technology and capability exploitation. I think there's a series of questions we have to address as I look at the aviation portfolio. What should we do differently to ensure that we get the right capability and the right uh, quantity at the right time that the force needs? Are we fo focused on the aircraft or are we focused on the capability? The current modular combat aviation brigade design challenges modernization efforts. The current one-size-fits-all modular cab design forces our traps, our capability, and capacity in that, in that force design? Should we build, build aviation lethality for armored and, or mechanized formations while focusing on tailored reach and protection for our light or air assault formations? Some say our cabs are not optimized for echelon above division or cross-domain requirements. And if we are outgunned, outranged, and have found ourselves on the wrong side of the cost curve for keeping up with the Joneses, with tolerance for incremental upgrades and very, very, very slowly buying out our fleets, how do we flip the paradigm? How do we upgrade just what is required and invest in leap ahead s and and R&D that will allow us to dominate across all future domains? Do we have the right mix of manned and unmanned aircraft? What capabilities will aviation formations deliver to their open or take advantage of open windows, opportunities, periods of dominance in the A2AD environment? What are the technologies that matter most to Army aviation and how do we bridge the gap? So like the whole Army, Army aviation must chart a course for evolution, adaptation, and innovation. This path demands clear vision and continuity among leaders. Otherwise, we will be unprepared and will be forced to learn deadly lessons at a tremendous cost in the future. It's imperative that we modernize the fleet to set the force to dominate in all environments. We must maintain current readiness, bridge the gap, and retain overmatch in lethality, protection, and reach. Another challenge that we're working on to address in the building is the very slow, tedious, laborious Big A acquisition. Acquisition from concepts, requirements, to test, to delivery of capability. Innovation in, in this area is constrained by a seemingly archaic acquisition process driving us along timelines, inefficient development cost, torturous contracting reviews, 
exhaustive, exhaustive testing and evaluation, and a maze of type classification and full material release documentation. In fact, one of our program managers stated that even if the system was on the shelf, ready to go, he'd require three years to field it to a soldier just from contracting and material release. We must do better, and I think in some areas we are. So last year, last year the Chief reinvigorated the AROC, the Army Requirements Oversight Council, in order to better streamline and synchronize requirement document and resource approval. It's no longer about just approving the requirement document. The AROC now is about synchronizing requirements, acquisition, and resources. The final decision that we ask ourselves at the end of every AROC is, is this where the Army should spend its next dollar? Because every portfolio is competing for that next or last dollar. We recognize that the pursuit of perfection is the enemy of good enough. Army senior leaders are interested in significantly reducing the time it takes to get capability to the field, and that is an understatement. Likewise, Army leaders want to decrease developmental costs by leveraging industry's efforts and investments. And I think there are some exciting new um, alternatives and uh, alternative approaches, such as the Defense Innovation uh, Unit Experimental, DIUX, other transaction authorities, new consortiums, the Army's Ar uh, Rapid Capabilities Office, and initiatives internal to the Army to stand up empowered cross-functional teams to integrate synchronized concepts to the, to the delivery of those capabilities. These provide promise for accelerating programs and delivering the right capabilities to the force. So for what it's worth, just some from my experience over the last uh, year or so, a few ideas for consideration for a path to successfully move from requirements to resources to acquisition and delivering a capability. I think we need to try the try before you buy, and make adjustments to requirements based on cost and performance. We need to get systems into the hands of soldiers early to inform concepts, to inform TTPs, to inform the requirement. We should increase and protect our 6-4 uh, resources to facilitate the transition of technology from s and to programs of record, and provide the analytical support and architecture for the requirement in order to complete analysis of alternatives. We need to institute agile acquisition strategies that allow for incremental improvements through buying less more often. Take advantage of minimal development, commercially available mature prototypes and production systems, and we need to balance technology readiness with cost benefit value. Army leaders, frankly, are often, uh, often experience sticker shock for new capabilities, and this is true with aviation systems. This leads to the perception that either the requirement is gold-plated or industry is using premium pricing. PMs must clearly articulate cost drivers to inform afford affordability trade decisions. Finally, we need to increase early prototyping and experimentation where it makes sense. The final, um, the final constraint on innovation is the limit we place on our own imagination, I think. This is where you can help most. Your creativity, cutting edge technology, groundbreaking capabilities, and revolutionary concepts provide the impetus towards overmatch for force modernization. For our industry partners in the room, I think, what, what do we owe you? We owe you clear concepts, clear requirements, and predictable resources to enable you to compete and win programs of record. And all of us together, I think we recognize what we owe our citizens and the nation is the most powerful and dominant land force in the world. So um, in closing, I just want to thank you again for the opportunity to, to share with you some, some great news. And on Army modernization, some of our challenges. I know Bill Gaylor is going to follow me, and uh, he's going to answer all the really tough questions that you all have. Um, he also said he knows some country songs, so he'd be happy to entertain in that respect. And in uh, tradition, in G8 tradition, I just want to say you're welcome. <laughs> Thanks.